Pastor Tyler here. It is Thursday, October 15th, and I'm wearing black for Thursdays in black towards a world without rape and violence. As we journey through the month of October, uh, one of the days that we observe as a society is World Food Day on October 16th. It's a day when we're mindful of food security around the world, of the availability and access that different people in different parts of the world have, um, hunger in different parts of the world, and certainly the abundance that we have in our society and what we might do to work towards the availability and access of food uh, for other people in other parts of the world. Also in this month of October, as Lutherans, we're mindful of the Reformation, and so I'm holding that up. Um, and part of the throwback for today is to 2012 at the study conference at Lutheran Theological Seminary in Saskatoon, when the Reverend Dr. Gordon Jensen was presenting. He gave a lecture called, Who Eats What? And he's a Reformation scholar. And, uh, and so in that lecture, he tells about Martin Bucer. And Bucer was um, a theologian at the, around the same time as Luther. He was a little bit younger than Luther, but uh, his years overlapped uh, quite a bit. Luther was born in 1483. Bucer was born in 1491. Luther died in 1546. Bucer died in 1551. So they were very close in age. And Bucer um, sort of followed in Luther's footsteps, came to some realizations about his own faith, his Roman Catholic faith, and joined in the Reformation efforts uh, early on. And he had a very ecumenical perspective and is probably uh, remembered for that. And part of what Dr. Jensen speaks about in this lecture from uh, May of 2012 is the mediating voice that Bucer was between uh, Martin Luther and Zwingli from, uh, from Switzerland. They were arguing over the Eucharist. And that's kind of the connection to World Food Day today. Who is fed and what are they eating? Is it the real presence of Christ? Is it the flesh and blood in some literal way of Christ? And, uh, and who is able to join in that meal? Is it only for Christians? Can anybody approach the table? And so Bootser was trying to get Luther and Zwingli to speak so that maybe there was a way of, um, of joining the Reformation movements of Switzerland area and, and Germany area uh, together in a closer way. And um, so listen to some of what he says and, uh, and some of the early ecumenical uh, efforts in the 16th century. But finally, the two of them, uh, the two parties agreed that Martin Bootser would represent the South Germans, Philip Melanchthon, the uh, Wittenberg theologians, and they would have formal negotiations in Castle, Germany to see if they could reach the first ecumenical agreement on the Lord's Supper. But they also reached, by the way, on baptism, but we often forget that. <laughs> to prepare for that, on December 17th, Luther sat down and wrote his instructions, as he called them, to Melanchthon for the uh, discussions. Now, originally, Luther had planned to meet with Melanchthon in person, and you think it would be easy to do because they lived four houses from each other. <laughs> it wasn't uh, very far apart, but with their heavy travel schedules, it wasn't always possible. Uh, the other uh, difficulty at this point was that Luther's wife, Katharina, was ready to go into labor at any moment and had been experiencing difficulties in the later stages of her pregnancy, so Luther had been quite preoccupied with these domestic matters. And in a sense, it was like, I don't have time to be thinking right now with all that's going on at home about another negotiation over the Lord's Supper that probably won't go anywhere. So in a kind of a very blunt, blustery way, he sat down seven points in his handwritten instructions to Melanchthon. And of course he says, I'm uneasy about entering into this agreement. We're rushing into it. And this was after four years of heavy negotiations uh, with Bootser and another eight years uh, before the uh, Yeah, Sort of like restructuring issues. <laughs> but Booth, uh, Luther was also kind of cautious about entering into an agreement because uh, 
He felt that uh, if he did that, people would see that as a sign that he was now changing his position on the Lord's Supper. That he must have budged somewhere along the line. And that would start the tongues wagging. Now, another problem is that Luther also, instead of talking to Melanchthon, writes it down and hands it on to him. And it didn't sit well with Melanchthon, his uh, colleague, because Melanchthon felt like he was being dictated to and being told uh, what he was allowed to say and not say. And, and uh, you know, after being a senior faculty member for many years, that's kind of an insult. Um, in fact, in a letter right afterwards, uh, Melanchthon writes to a friend, uh, Joachim Camarius, and says, uh, I was treated as an ambassador in a foreign affair. I was simply having to pass on information, and uh, as you can imagine, there was a lot of tension then in Wittenberg camp. The other thing is that uh, Melanchthon at this time was also being wooed by uh, uh, England to come and teach there. And the, actually the elector in Saxony had to raise his salary to get him to stay. <laughs> Bootser also had his own troubles in his camp. Uh, he uh, traveled so much, I'm thinking that in today's world, uh, he would put many of us to shame. The amount of miles he put on going from place to place to try to bring out about an agreement. Uh, and it didn't help that uh, uh, Zwingli and others were uh, upset with Luther's bluntness. It didn't help that Ocalampadius uh, was uh, doing his own thing and suggesting other alternatives. And it especially didn't help that Karlstadt, former dean of the faculty in Wittenberg, was now spouting off how, uh, 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 with a totally different view of the sacrament than Luther. And uh, Bootser was trying to collect all of these together to come to a common agreement that they could sign with Luther. Uh, reminds me, you could probably make a Mission Impossible movie based on this one for him. But they finally decide to come together. And two phrases in the things they wrote on that day, the Constance Articles, as they were known, and the instructions to Melanchthon, really uh, contain each a phrase that identifies and shapes the dialogue and the agreement that is reached two years later. And it's interesting because it is only Two words for Bootser and four words for Luther that make all the difference and both addressing this question, who eats what? Bootser wrote in his uh, Constance Articles that the body of Christ is truly and really present with the bread and that Christ's true presence is, and here's his two words, given and distributed. What it also reflects then from, from this is they operated, Bootser and Luther operated from a different perspective. Bootser really had a subjective view of the sacrament. That they are the body and blood uh, of Christ, the elements, uh, to the person of faith. Now, Lutherans are quite uh, familiar with that because that really <coughs> is a, a cornerstone in a lot of the pietistic tradition. It's a very subjective one. Everything will depend upon the faith of the believer, the one who is accepting it. Um, and if uh, there is no faith, there is uh, no sacrament. Now, for Bootser, it also meant that it protected in his mind uh, the unworthy from uh, abusing the sacrament. <coughs> Luther, on the other hand, insisted upon, uh, rather than subjective, an objective approach to it. That regardless of the faith of the believer, what God gives in the sacrament, Christ's body and the forgiveness of sins, is given no matter the faith of the believer. Luther does that for a couple of reasons. First of all, and I think his most important, <laughs> is uh, his uh, ex exegesis of the um, passage from 1 Corinthians 11 when uh, uh, it talks about unworthy eating, uh, Luther, dealing with that, says if unbelievers are only eating bread, why would you bother with a warning? 
They're only eating bread, and it won't be, they won't be harmful. That you could actually eat unto your condemnation. For Luther, in his exegesis, suggested it was actually uh, was eaten, and it was an objective declaration. But for Luther, it was also that, uh, that focus completely on the actions of God that one could trust. And otherwise, if you uh, didn't have those two last words, how could you ever be sure that when you had come to the table, you had actually eaten and received the forgiveness of sins, that which the sacrament promised? If it still depended upon the faith of the believer, um, now you have a different version of the works righteousness connected with the sacrament. These are words that were found on the Canadian Food Grains Bank website from a resource for World Food Day. It's a paraphrase of Psalm 23. Let us pray. O Holy One, you are our host as well as our shepherd. You invite us to the banquet, the banquet of life. All parts of the world are invited, enemies and friends the alienated and powerful, those close at hand and those far off. You offer the abundance and lavishness of bread broken and shared and the cup of refreshment that leads to new life. We praise and thank you for your abundant spirit. Goodness and love unfailing, these will follow us all the days of our lives and we shall dwell in the home of our God for all eternity. Amen.